100 kilometers above the Earth's surface lies an invisible frontier, the edge of space. This is the Karman line, the boundary between our planet's atmosphere and what lies beyond. What does it take to cross that line? To date, some 450 cosmonauts, astronauts, taikonauts, the names all mean the same, have crossed that unseen line. Cold War test pilots to begin with, then geologists, engineers and scientists of one kind or another. Mission specialists now come in all sizes and nationalities. Even politicians and cashed up tourists have gate crashed the space party. But how do you earn an astronaut's wings? As Chris Hadfield, the first Canadian to walk in space, has said, an astronaut's life is one of preparation and simulation, and training and support on the ground, and anticipation and visualization, and very, very seldom, almost never, is an astronaut's life about flying in space. In one sense, the key to becoming an astronaut is simple, brute force. selection for space is an exhaustive process. Astronaut candidates must be fit, physically and mentally, to endure the rigors of training. High intelligence is essential, while bravery is a useful character trait. The current crew of astronauts have trained for work on the International Space Station, while others are working towards missions yet to come. They have one thing in common. They all consider themselves lucky. I never planned to, to become an astronaut. I mean, I knew that uh, it's, it's a very small likelihood. And so uh, as a scientist, I knew the statistics, meaning like, OK, if I, if I try to become an astronaut, it probably won't work out. So for me, applying uh, with ESA to become an astronaut was not as much a thing of me believing that I would become an astronaut, but more trying to give my dream a chance that I had, that I, that I knew I would always looking forward or, or trying to to see do I have a chance to actually go there. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. It also helps if you know how to use one of these. I find my background as a pilot very helpful just in the, the way that I've previously been taught uh, how to um, follow procedures, for example, as a pilot, um, communication methods, working together in a team and in an international environment. All of those sort of skills are very useful in this job. 
Of course, I had uh, expectations before I started. Um, but the job is, as an astronaut is, is so unique. I think it's, it's difficult to, to have a realistic sense of, of what to expect. So certainly some things have been what I expected. I mean, the excitement, the uniqueness, the, the wonder of human spaceflight is exactly what I thought it'd be. Uh, other things, of course, have, have been different simply because it's, it's such a unique world to train uh, for a mission. Astronaut candidates should expect a two-year period of training and evaluation. Learning to live and work in extreme environments comes right at the start. Movie buffs will recall Key Largo in Florida as an isolated place for Humphrey Bogart. Now it houses NASA's NEMO facility Aquarius, training astronauts for both the ISS and future asteroid missions. Other unwelcoming environments used for isolation and team building include the Sagruta Caves in Sardinia, Italy. The ISA Caves mission uh, that I was a part of a few years ago where I spent a week living uh, underneath the ground in a gigantic cave system. The two NASA NEMO missions that I've been able to participate in. I mean, all these things are fantastic opportunities in and of themselves. Um, and just having those opportunities without going to space is, would, would be fantastic. But so to have them and then to go to space as well is, is just really a, it's what makes this job so unique and, and so fantastic. Of course, space flight training is not easy. Uh, I think uh, that's clear. Uh, I mean, for three and a half years, you have to travel almost every three weeks. You fly over the Atlantic, you're in different training locations. You spend about 5% of your time at home. Uh, and if so, maybe then just a weekend here or there. So it's a challenge. Training takes us all around the world into every center. I've already done two or three orbits around the world, but just in a plane going from NASA to Russia to Japan and back to Europe. Uh, so it's, it's already, the training as an astronaut in itself is already rewarding. I mean, it's already the dream job. Uh, and even better, it gets you to a flight in the end. So there's no time to, uh, to be bored. There's no time to think too much about what you're doing. Every day you're busy, every day is a good day. And that's going to continue until the flight. Use the ladder, okay. careful, and I'll just follow you. And we'll sit down there. Space training in Europe begins at the European Astronaut Center in Cologne, Germany, where trainees learn the essentials of maintenance and repair of onboard systems. We would be asked to actually either move or clean or just inspect the filter. We would need to close the line. They also continue their basic EVA training in another unfriendly environment, underwater. In general, the, the training at the different locations uh, varies quite a bit. Uh, first, there's the technical side, which means like we're training in Japan on the systems that Japan supplied to the space station. In Russia, we're training on the Russian segment of the International Space Station. In the US, we train for the US side. And at ESA, we train for Columbus and ATV, which are the modules that ESA supplied to, to the space station. Next, the candidates move on to NASA's larger Johnson Space Flight Center in Houston, Texas for extensive EVA training. Training at the JSC is always uh, very busy because we do many different things and it's a huge facility so we're moving all the time from one building to the other. Like here we are in the building 9 where we have a replica of all the 
uh, American modules of the space station. So in this building we train for the space station. Some of it is daily operations, some of it is actually off nominal operations like emergencies. Like in these mock-ups in this building, uh, just yesterday I did a five-hour emergency simulation with my crewmates, with our full crew complement of six people of Expedition 42. And that of course is not something that you would call uh, daily uh, operations, that's something that we really don't want to happen, but we train it a lot because emergencies would put us as crew in danger. HCN 1.2 The great thing about being trained on emergencies is that it, it gives you a state of mind. Having the knowledge, having the training can help you in any, in any situation, in any condition, just like it happened to me uh, during my EVA. It was an unexpected emergency that we had not been trained for, but because you have received training that it's all encompassing, it gives you the state of mind where you look forward to the solution rather than focusing on the problem. EVAs, extravehicular activities, sound routine enough. But spacewalks, as we know them, are among the most dangerous duties an astronaut must carry out. Preparation and safety conscious planning are critical. Behind me you see a lot of equipment which is related to the airlock operations in case of a spacewalk, so we train this here as well. But there's also another completely different facility, which is the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. That's a huge pool, and in there we train for spacewalks underwater. Neutral buoyancy training tanks are in place at ESA's Cologne facility and at Star City in Moscow. But JSC has the biggest. EVA training is, is fantastic. It's, it's physically difficult. It's one of the most challenging parts of the training, but it's also one of the most realistic. Uh, when you're in the pool for six hours, uh, you get tired, but at some point you really think you're on the ISS, you look around you, uh, and there's a structure everywhere. Uh, sometimes you even get disoriented because that's what happens in space. It's like a 3D labyrinth of, of uh, technology, it's a maze of technology. There is so much going on here because we not only train space station, but uh, robotics, spacewalks. So it's a, um, a very complex training system and it's, it's very exciting to be part of it. I think one of the hardest parts of the astronaut's job is to retain all this different information over the two and a half year period from being assigned to actually launching. Um, yeah, there's an awful lot of information on the Soyuz, on the space station itself, robotic training, EVA training, the list goes on. So um, to try and retain all that, uh, the way that they do that is just by having a refresher training really along our path to launch. JAXA, Japan's space agency, trains astronauts in the operation of the country's ISS contribution, the Kibo Experiment Module, with its space exposure platform. Oh, so this is nominal. I guess it has a very Japanese flavor to it. I mean, the, the content and the, the way the content is presenting and delivered is pretty much standardized. But of course, uh, you know, the, the instructors are Japanese. The, they have that um, very polite, very kind uh, uh, Japanese way about them. In Saint-Hubert, Quebec, the Canadian Space Agency's Mobile Servicing System Operations Complex schools astronauts in using robotic arms on station. Here's a station uh, at scale, and here's a robotic arm also at scale. It moves and we can plan our maneuvers. As you can see, the main challenge is to not hit anything while you're moving this arm, because all you got, really, when you're working, if you come here, there's this workstation. You got a couple of camera views to work from. You got your hand controllers to move the arm, and you get the, you know, some computer displays and a bunch of switches here on the left. That's all you got. So you really gotta think ahead uh, how you're gonna maneuver this arm without crashing into anything, because of course uh, that would be a very bad day uh, on orbit. Star City near Moscow in Russia was the birthplace of manned spaceflight. It remains a key training center, where all ISS assigned trainee astronauts go through the program. When you first start in Star City, you, you immediately feel that you're, you're part of, of something bigger than just your own personal history, because your personal story, because you see people who've been here since the beginning. Um, there's even supposedly Yuri Gagarin's wife is still living here, even though she's very old, she's still living in the vicinity. Uh, so you just cross people in the corridor and they've, they've known all those guys and I was just a kid and those guys were already in, in human spaceflight. So um, you try to learn as much as you can, you try to um, do your best for the technical side of the job and, and try to interact as much as possible with the people because they're so experienced that they have a lot to give you. 
Expecting the unexpected is a basic training principle, like landing off course after the mission or touching down in the Siberian tundra. As NASA has no manned flight hardware of its own at present, the agency purchases seats on Russia's Soyuz spacecraft. All astronauts must be trained on the Soyuz systems, which poses a problem of its own. Everything is, of course, in Russian. All the documentations in Russian in the Soyuz spacecraft, and of course all the conversations in Russian as well, which is the reason for us having all of the Russian lessons during our training flow. Not only must you know the Russian language, when in Russian spacecraft, you must also wear Russian spacesuits. When the Sokol space suit actually pressurizes, things do become much more difficult to work because um, you're kind of fixed in your seat in a very rigid location and it's hard to bend your arms and bend your fingers in, in fact so even just sort of reading the board documentation can be quite difficult but hopefully you won't be pressurized when you do a normal descent hopefully the the spacecraft will come down without any problems and your spacesuit will be much softer which makes it easier to move. Here in uh, Star City I'm using most of my time in the Soyuz simulator together with my commander Suddenly it's starting to feel a lot more real, you know, when you're sitting in the Soyuz and you're really going through the whole launch and landing sequence. You can feel that you're, you're getting close to the date and it's very, very exciting. It's a very well-oiled machine, this, this flow to launch, and I'm confident that, you know, by the time every astronaut flies, you're really ready to go, you're prepared in every way. As things stand, an astronaut bound for a six-month mission to the ISS needs up to five years training a requirement which will, in all likelihood, be intensified for future missions to deep space. The ISS will probably be used as a long-duration astronaut training facility for missions to Mars and beyond. We are also all people that are selected to be able to get along with each other. Uh, that's kind of like you, the way you select astronauts nowadays for, nowadays for long duration space flights. You really want to have people that are balanced, that are easy to get along with other people. So much of our work up there is determined by the visiting vehicle traffic. And that's a very dynamic um, phase because we're not quite sure exactly which vehicles are going to arrive when. And these vehicles bring up a lot of science, they bring up a lot of hardware uh, that is, determines when the EVAs are done, uh, and also they of course determine the robotics activity that goes on to capture the vehicles. So when you're not quite sure what the visiting vi vehicle schedule is like, you're not quite sure exactly what science and when it's going to be done on board the space station. One six months increment for the whole crew is around 300 experiments, uh, out of which there's 55, 60 for, uh, for ESA. So there's a wide array of, uh, of domains like medicine, um, technology, um, material science, fluid science, um, everything you can think of. We're trying to make the most of the, the conditions in space and the, and the microgravity to, to get results that wouldn't be possible uh, to achieve on Earth. So one of the things I've learned is you just have to be extremely flexible and we get trained on how to do tasks that, that may be planned six months ahead of our mission and may be planned six months after our mission so that should there be some flex and those activities fall within our increment then we're trained and we're ready to do those as well. There's some leftover smell. Whoa. <laughs> Not good. Not good. Looking out of the window is really one of the most fantastic experiences that you can have from the International Space Station. Our Earth is so beautiful and yet when you look outside you see that the atmosphere that surrounds our Earth is so thin. It's merely like 
an eggshell around an egg. It's so fragile and the vulnerability, uh, the fragility of our planet is very, very bi visible from on Earth. You see this blue ball and then above nothing, just black, absolutely nothing in this immense universe. And I would hope that more people would be able to fly to space, more maybe of our politicians, decision makers, decision makers would be able to fly to space and really see the vulnerability of our planet so that we can finally start doing something about climate change. just so prepared. All the emergencies, all the possible failures, we trained them over and over and over again. So we were supposed to be able to handle any situation. We sat in the simulator hundreds of hours. Uh, we know the systems inside out. So there's nothing really that we fear, I think, on the technical side. Even with all that training, astronauts are well aware of the dangers of space flight riding a rocket full of explosive fuel, living in an enclosed environment with a thin sheet of aluminium between you and hard vacuum, solar and cosmic radiation, bullet-like micrometeorites and space debris. Then there is the threat of onboard fire or mechanical failure, and to cap it all off, the fiery return to Earth. There is, however, one problem that returning astronauts cannot avoid, and that's gravity. When you get back home, of course, uh, I will always remember this was the same for my first flight or for my second flight. The moment they open up the hatch and you feel this fresh, cold air coming into your capsule. This is really something. And you're out there, of course, in the step. You have this real soil kind of uh, smell that you have. It's, it's really feeling fantastic. And then they get you out of the capsule. And the first thing, of course, that you want to do is to contact your family, your friends, say, I'm all right, everything is great. We will see each other uh, tonight. And then you just want to rest and to sleep because you're so tired, of course, from this long day of coming back. And also the gravity is really then having an impact on your body. You you can't, uh, it's difficult to stand up, it's everything that you have to lift is hard, it's, uh, it's difficult and this takes a couple of days uh, but after a couple of days of course you recover well. We have a very good recovery program uh, here at our European uh, Astronaut Center. Our uh, people are really very focused on getting the astronaut back up to the level as he was before the flight as soon as possible and then of course it's uh, again after a while business as usual. I'm reaching the end of my career and I'm being able to to do a last flight and really, again, put at work for myself, but also for everybody else, all the knowledge and know-how that I've acquired during this year. It's a very great opportunity and I'm, and I'm really happy uh, that I've been assigned for this. There is another way of crossing that unseen line on the edge of space, by paying your own way as the ultimate tourist. A number of wealthy individuals have already done so. Soon enough, it will become cheaper and accessible to the ordinary mortal, provided he or she can pass the medical. You know, when, when our test pilots and, and wonderful team that run Virgin Galactic say uh, that it's, we're ready and ready to go, uh, then, you know, I'll be ready to climb in and, and, and you know, be, be the, you know, the first, um, the first passenger as such, um, you know, to go to space and to become an astronaut. Um, and from there, hopefully, thousands of people will follow me. Launching payloads into space is no straightforward matter. Historically, rocket launches have been used as the proverbial swords into plowshares. Missiles designed to carry atomic warheads now send satellites and probes into the solar system. Ironically, it's one of the few exploits mankind undertakes that doesn't occur in nature.
rocket science is all it's cracked up to be. Bringing together the mathematical, engineering and mechanical skills required to design, build, test and successfully launch a rocket into space is a mammoth technical undertaking. So many countries and corporations have the capacity for launches nowadays that they appear commonplace. Zero. Only the keenest science geeks seem to watch them these days, unless, of course, something goes wrong, and then everyone is hooked. Space launchers fall within several categories, based on their payload or cargo weight and where it needs to get to. The unsung heroes are the commercial satellite delivery systems, providing light and medium lift capability to low Earth, polar or geosynchronous orbit. Many countries such as Argentina, Iran, North Korea and Ukraine boast their own homegrown systems. Even New Zealand, in a joint venture with the US, is developing a budget CubeSat launcher called Electron. The Soviet Union, first to harness its ballistic missiles, has several workhorses like the Proton rocket family, the Rokot, Zenit, Dnieper and sea-launched Volna systems. Ukraine, in its current form, inherited some of these rocket systems after the Soviet breakup. Like the Proton, these systems use highly toxic fuels. They will be phased out by 2030 and replaced by the Angara rocket system, which is both environmentally friendly and modular in construction to save launch costs. The Angara rockets are designed to put payloads ranging from 3,800 to 24,500 kilograms into low Earth orbit. The Russian Soyuz rocket, designed in the 1950s, has proved to be the most reliable rocket system ever flown. Upgraded to version 2, it will continue to operate alongside Angara. The Russians are also looking to develop a replacement for their aging Soyuz TMA spacecraft, with several designs already on the drawing board. Japan has its Epsilon satellite launcher, which can lift 1.2 tons into orbit. Their H2 continues to evolve, the B variant delivering cargo missions to the ISS. Ignition. And liftoff. Liftoff of the HTV on a journey to the International Space Station. India's ISRO space organization has developed a range of vehicles for delivering satellites, either to polar orbit with the PSLV or geosynchronous with the GSLV Mark II. India has big plans for space development, one of which is to build a man-rated capsule.
The Chinese Long March series of rockets has made steady progress and powers China's manned space program. Even they are becoming environmentally conscious as well. The Long March 5 heavy thrust cluster rocket with a loading capacity up to 25 tons is by far the largest carrier rocket China has. Compared with previous rockets, the biggest difference is the non-toxic propellant in hydrogen-oxygen engines and LOX kerosene engines that will not pollute the environment. And we applied serialization, unitization and modularization to design and manufacture. Another major player in launch capability is the European Space Agency, ESA, with its facility at Kourou in French Guiana. The Vega launcher developed by ESA and the Italian Space Agency continues to operate for light payloads. The real European success story, however, is the Ariane 5 heavy lifter the workhorse for ESA and the CNES. But it too will shortly be replaced by Ariane 6. Currently under development, it will use components in common with the new Vega C rocket. Ariane 6 will reduce the cost of, uh, of a launch service by 50% compared to today. So you have to realize that in, in just four years, we are reducing the cost of a launch service in Europe with 50%. And that is, of course, in a major step. And if you think about Ariane 6 in a double, double launch configuration, we are able to offer a price which is really, really attractive, also in comparison with the, comp the competition. So the, the, the situation that we will have with Ariane 6 and Vega C will be exactly the same in terms of what we can launch as we have today with uh, Vega, Ariane 5 and Soyuz. We can launch every satellite with these two launches in the future. It is very clear that the international competition is getting more and more intensive. It is very clear, especially from the American side, we can see that there is a, a systematic, uh, let me say, aggressive approach of the market to gain uh, market share uh, by American uh, suppliers of launch services. When NASA, intent on pursuing the Orion and SLS deep space system, relegated low Earth orbit to the private sector, the commercial floodgates were opened. The United Launch Alliance took over the existing NASA hardware and services and now operates the venerable Atlas V, along with the Delta II and heavy lift Delta IV systems. It's now developing the Vulcan rocket for future expansion. Five, four, we have main engine ignition, two, one, and lift off. Lift off of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket carrying the NROL 37 mission. The uh, Vulcan Centaur vehicle will be a high performance, lower cost, best value vehicle. We're going to maintain our mission success history that we've had with, with Atlas and Delta. So we've got uh, two main engine suppliers, Blue Origin with the BE-4, which is a natural gas-powered engine, and we've got the, the AR-1 uh, from Aerojet Rocketdyne, that is the RP-1 configuration. Both of those teams are making, uh, making good progress. We've been through CDR with the Blue Origin engine, and we've been through PDR. They're both on, uh, on a plan to get to engine testing this year. They're both on a path to, uh, to support our uh, late 2019 launch date. With that mission now opened up to commercial ventures, many companies are rushing to build better, safer and, most importantly, cheaper rockets. Two private service suppliers for NASA are Orbital ATK and SpaceX. 
These are the first two contracted by NASA for current ISS resupply payloads and planned manned transfer missions. Orbital uses Minotaur rockets, which are in reality the MX Peacekeeper ICBM, which was never fully deployed as a result of disarmament treaties. Orbital has modified these rockets to carry scientific payloads. Their heavy payload launcher is the Antares 230 and 232, which can lift 8,000 kilograms into low Earth orbit, including the Cygnus spacecraft. With the Falcon 9, Elon Musk's SpaceX company is working on the principle of recycling or reusing launch systems to make launches cost-effective. They can now return the main launch stage back to Earth and land it safely to be refurbished and ready to launch again. working on their heavy lift Falcon, which will be able to lift 54,000 kilos into orbit or 13,600 kilograms towards Mars and then return to the launch site for reuse. Even the Falcon Heavy, however, will be dwarfed by the upcoming NASA Space Launch System. It will tower over everything previously seen, with the capacity to put 130,700 kilograms into orbit or send 52 metric tons into deep space. Its first task will be to fly the Orion crew capsule and a probe to the Galilean moon Europa. Sending humans into orbit is another matter altogether. Here, launchers have to be incredibly reliable and able to lift very heavy payloads safely. In other words, they have to be man-rated. The only two man-rated capsules at present are the Chinese Shenzhou and the Russian Soyuz TMA. Unsurprisingly, they look very alike. The Russians, however, are looking to the future and a crowded commercial market. Their Soyuz has successfully flown over 120 missions, but a new, cheaper capsule called Federation is underway. It will carry up to six cosmonauts and will be competing against NASA's commercial crew development program, which has Boeing and SpaceX delivering cargo and soon astronauts to low Earth orbit. Aerospace giant Boeing's space capsule the CST-100 Starliner is to ferry astronauts to and from the International Space Station. Starliner is go. When you're sitting in the capsule on top of a rocket Four, and the three, final moments of two, the countdown are happening, one. it's exciting. It's like being on the top of that roller coaster when you're a little bit scared, but you're really pumped because this is what you've been working for all your life, taking that next step into exploration. Truck deploy. 
charge is good. California-based SpaceX is developing its Dragon capsule to carry crew to low Earth orbit and beyond. The crewed version of Dragon would carry up to seven astronauts to the orbiting lab. Origin is a strong competitor to both contractors, but its sights are on the tourist suborbit segment. They too have designed their rocket to return to launch for reuse, and their capsule, the Blue Shepherd, can hold six paying customers. There it is, 70,000 pounds of thrust pushing that crew capsule. The B3 engine remains on, the booster continues to space. The drogues are out on the crew capsule. There go the mains. And touchdown of the new Shepard crew capsule. From what we can tell, that was a nominal in-flight test of our escape system. And again, all astronauts on board would have had a pretty exhilarating ride. But Boing. an extraordinary test and a tremendous final flight for both craft. Their main rival will probably be Virgin Galactic or Vulcan Aerospace with their air-launched systems. Sierra Nevada's Dream Chaser is a small space plane designed to carry seven. The spacecraft is based on a NASA concept vehicle from the 1980s called the HL-20. Having failed to secure a NASA contract, Sierra Nevada has teamed up with Vulcan and European interests to further develop a version of the Dream Chaser. Advances in aeronautical engine design have led to the Sabre. We're actually at Reaction Engine's test site at B9. What is very significant about this is that we are in the process of testing a very, very important development in aerospace propulsion, which is a, a pre-cooler, a device for cooling the air, entering a high-speed engine, so that the engine can continue to operate pretty much as normal. This means that uh, we're going to be able to fly at speeds of Mach 5 pretty easily in the future. It is in effect a rocket engine burning hydrogen and oxygen. That in itself is not unusual, but whilst in the atmosphere the oxygen is taken from the air, cooled to liquid temperatures and fed directly into the combustion chamber, once outside the atmosphere, the engine resorts to the liquid oxygen carried on board, like a conventional rocket engine. Skylon will be powered by two Sabre engines and operate like a conventional aircraft capable of flying directly into orbit, transporting 15 tons of cargo into space and returning for a runway landing. We're looking at a revolution in transportation equivalent to the jet engine and uh, access to space, access to anywhere in the world within four hours is on the cards. Once you've got access to space on that basis, that's the stepping stone to anywhere in the universe and a very exciting future for the human race. 
Although government contracts are lucrative for these private companies, many firmly believe tourism is the way to fund future space development. For those cashed up civilian tourists, Space Adventures team has designed a circumlunar mission using a unique combination of existing and flight tested Russian technology. The combination of the Soyuz spacecraft and the lunar module will provide ample living space for your approximately six day journey and the fuel required for you to leave low Earth orbit. Perhaps the most ambitious is Elon Musk's SpaceX interplanetary transport system, helping make humanity a multi-planet species. The initial design objective of the vehicle is to launch a variety of missions to Mars and other destinations in the beyond Earth orbit portion of the solar system. The large payload capacity of the launch vehicle, with the ability to place 300 tons into low Earth orbit, places it into the super heavy lift class. The ITS launch vehicle's first stage is designed to be reusable, following a return to the launch site and vertical landing after each launch. What's new on this vehicle is full reusability of even the second stage and the spacecraft as well. Cheap, safe space travel for all is just around the corner.